Hello, I'm Luca De Giglio, and this is the Web3 in Travel podcast, where you can learn about crypto, blockchain, and how the new internet will change travel. In the last few days, I've been looking at those YouTube videos um, called Reactions, in which people listen to a song for the first time, and they, they kind of react live. So you've got these, I don't know, young girl who listens to Pink Floyd, Comfort to be Numb for the first time, and they go, well, they give their reaction. It's a very, very interesting uh, way to kind of re relieve um, also my own experiences with, uh, with this music. And then it came to my mind, maybe I could do the same for the podcast. I could listen to Web3 in Travel, uh, not songs, of course, but Web3 in Travel, um, presentations or, or panels, etc., and kind of you know let you listen part of it and then comment on top of it. Um, so I went in YouTube and I typed Web3 Travel, and there's not much. There's really little actually. Um, but I found a nice panel uh, from a few days ago at Focus Right at the conference, and I found this panel really interesting with really knowledgeable people. And let's see, I, I'm, maybe not, I won't do the reaction thing because it requires me to make you listen to part of it and it could be too long. Uh, so maybe I just get the subjects, uh, what they talked about, tell you what they talked about and kind of comment on top of it. Let's see how it goes. So the panel title is um, Blockchain, Game Changer or Bust. How Web3 is disrupting travel. So this is from the 17th of November, at least the video. I don't know the, the, the speech exactly. Still, it's, it's during the FTX. So that's why there's bust in the title. And it, it is at the Focusrite conference in 2022, which is not a blockchain conference. It's a travel conference. Maybe it's the travel conference. Um, so the, the public is not blockchain enabled in a way it's like travel travel companies travel travel professionals and there's you know there's always somebody talking about blockchain and this time i think we went up a notch in terms of uh, of quality and yeah i just decided i won't make you listen to anything this is probably copyrighted stuff so i won't get into trouble for that i just tell you what they talk about and then i'm gonna comment so apologies for maybe raising your expectations too much about that so the first interesting subject here is uh, data integrity, uh, which basically means with blockchain or distributed ledger technology, then maybe we're going to see the difference between the two. Um, there is one place where everybody looks at the data. And there's a couple of companies here talking about that. And these are BlockSky and Arise. Arise, Arise, Travel. Um, both, I think they are both for corporate, um, so business to business stuff. And the basic assumption here is that it's better to have data in one place where, again, everybody looks at it, but if you have it in one place, well, who's going to take care of this data? Are we going to trust one single actor? No, we're going to trust the blockchain, which basically means we're going to trust the network. That's it. That's the idea. It's actually pretty obvious because today in, in travel, every company has its own data and they communicate through APIs and some APIs are open, some are not, etc. We discussed this in the, in the podcast in the past. It is certainly better to have one place where you look at it, right? It, it's a bit funny because you could say, well, this is a more centralized approach. And in some parts it is because you're moving away from a place where every company is a node with its own data. So again, Booking has its own data, Airbnb its own data, Qatar Airlines its own data, and they exchange data on a case-by-case -case situation, which makes it in a way hard because you know if you don't have APIs, if you don't have complete access to everything, uh, you have to build it, you have to go through a lot of contracts. And at the same time, it's decentralized because you're not trusting one source of truth. Now, before blockchains, one source of truth 
will be really dangerous because you know you can have a company which has all the travel data in the world and makes this as its business and it's paid for this but then it's too much power in one hand is the ring and we know that the one ring means power over everybody else and power gets corrupted and power gets abused so blockchains kind of tell you well we can do this in a different way many many rings none of them powerful but they kind of have a consensus now i always um get a bit suspicious when people say yeah we have distributed ledger technology we don't have blockchain which is not bad in itself but first of all what is it distributed ledger technology and uh, before i go ahead the company arise uh, says they have distributed ledger technology and i quickly check their website and it's really technically uh, complete so i'm thinking i'm gonna try to analyze it and if i find it if if, if i find this is understandable for me but i really like the fact that you can go in the in the details the technical details um so distribute the ledger technology well i don't know if there's a definition for that but basically means blockchain but corporate maybe uh or no, that's not a good one. It's mostly trying to give the same properties of blockchains. Uh, so I distribute the consensus, like we have agreement on on the truth, but we don't do it with blocks. We don't do it as blockchain do it. We, we do it in other ways. You know, blockchains work that in the, in the way that um, everybody submits a new block. And then if, if the block is validated by enough people, it gets added to the blockchain and this becomes the truth until the next block, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, distributed ledger technologies have different ways. Now, um, until now, blockchains are the winners, while well, blockchains are the beginning and distributed ledger technology, I think it comes out of blockchain or maybe it's existed before as a computer science field but it came to prominence because blockchains were successful. I'm not really sure about that. Anyway, in general, if it's blockchain, if it's really permissionless and open blockchain, fine, I'm comfortable with them. When you come with DLTs, okay, I get suspicious and I wanna know more. It doesn't mean they're not good or whatever, but I wanna know more. Uh, because in general, the use cases have been very corporate, very centralized, kind of a way to say, and I may be not fair here, but it, that, that's what comes to my mind. Okay, you are doing DLTs. It means you don't like to give up um, control to kind of a weird network. Uh, you want your intranet. That could be a good reading of it. DLTs, in my mind, are intranets and blockchains are internets. I don't know. I haven't followed uh, DLTs enough to, to give a judgment, but that's what comes to my mind. Anyway, imagine a travel industry where everything is in one place. So you are an app which allows you to book travels and you can do the whole booking in one go without having to make a lot of API connections. Everything is there. Maybe there's not the name of the person, but there's the identity, like the, the single identity represented by an address and you know this person uh, wants to book a flight, a hotel, a transfer, etc., and you can do this. You can book through, you know, to the sellers, basically to the providers directly without having to go through agreements and contracts, etc. So the blockchain technology in travel becomes kind of an aggregator of data. It takes the data out of the silos of every single company and it puts it online, open to everyone. So that can certainly bring a lot of advantages and these two companies i think block sky was saying this is today they're doing it today uh he mentioned millions of dollars of of transactions uh, done already on the blockchain now i'm gonna be checking what blockchain they use etc but this is not for now now we're staying at the theoretical level um okay so the advantage is very clear right Again, we're moving data away from closed doors to one place where data is everywhere and everybody can access to this. Imagine the innovations which can be done. Um, many years ago, I had an idea about um, social bookings. It was a way for you to say, okay, I want to go to Bangkok. I don't know what hotel to book. I'm not going to go on booking.com. I'm going to ask some expert. 
and uh, the expert will you know listen to your needs your budget and suggest something now was this a good or bad idea i don't know it never took off because we couldn't get access to data um, there are there were a few companies who would sell this data but they wouldn't even talk to us they, they were just doing for you know very very big companies and it was very expensive so there you go data is siloed is is closed and you can't innovate or at least innovation is only open to very big companies and we know that innovation comes from small companies from startups so that's part of the reason travel feels so like not developing and slow and, and kind of we still book like we booked 10 years ago what what happens in travel well the data is not free it's not open it's not easily accessible so yeah that's the that's the point and all the panelists agreed on that i think anybody who's working in blockchain in travel sees this as one of the biggest advantages and i can only agree with it what we don't know is how much things will change once we let's say liberate the data can we say that right the data is now captured for economical reasons and it's going to be liberated by blockchains is that a good way to to put it i think this is compelling they also spoke about payments and you know we spoke about payments or sorry for the king we here i spoke about uh payments uh, a lot in the podcast and there's an interesting point here with Brooke Armstrong, the co-CEO and co-founder of Block Sky, says that, you know, he's, he's talking about payments and he's making a point about crypto payments. And then he says, uh, I'm not saying that people will pay with Bitcoin. I don't think they will ever do that. And, you know, I tend to agree Bitcoin for payments is not a use case today. It's not going to happen. Uh, but I will never say never in crypto. Uh, in general, you know, never say never. Uh, if Bitcoin keeps growing uh, and then it reaches kind of a plateau in price and it becomes kind of stable, um, and then the layer twos like Lightning Network or other technologies arise, and people, especially people, start earning in Bitcoin, then yeah, probably people will want to pay in Bitcoin. It's, it looks very far, um, but it may happen. So, the only comment I can do here is like never say never in Bitcoin, in crypto, and well, in general, I would say. But he says another interesting thing, which is payments and settlement are getting closer and closer. And this is one of those things which happen behind the scenes in, in payments and in travel. And we don't really realize it as consumers. It's like you pay with a credit card for your booking and you think you paid the the hotel and you actually didn't yet because there's a whole process behind the scenes which happens and takes time and it's not finite so the, the, the transaction could be reversed so there's cost and time involved and with crypto you can have this finality basically instantly is it a good thing or a bad thing i really guess it depends on the use case and how this is done but he's pointing out that Payment and settlement getting closer is where the innovation is in payments. You see how we start from, okay, crypto and travel. Oh, it's for paying with crypto. No, it's much more. Uh, but yeah, it's also about paying with crypto. But it's not about paying with Bitcoin or, or a stable coin only. It's about making, in this case, that's one of the ideas, uh, payment and settlement closer because they are not closed. They have a, a gap and this creates a lot of I would say cost, friction, whatever. So they also talk about stablecoin payments. And I definitely agree that if and when people will start paying with crypto, stablecoins are going to be the, the first ones because we want to you know, pay with stable stuff. We don't want to, every time we spend money, think, am I paying this thing double or am I paying half? Should I wait? Was it a good moment to spend this money, et cetera, et cetera. So an interesting question, Norm Rose, which is the moderator, he's a senior technology and corporate market analyst at Focusrite. So the guy works for Focusrite, and I really like the way the way he presented this. Uh, he moderated this panel. He asks, well, but, okay, cool. This technology is making things easier. How much are we going to save? And Brooke Armstrong from BlockSky says 4%. He gives us a number, and that's that's interesting because that means, you know, 
when you are so precise and so fast in giving an answer, it means you know what you're talking about in a way, right? Especially because it is running a business which is actually doing transactions. It's not just a theoretical thing. And apart from the number, um, what is it talks about an example in which you know you you make um, a business trip and then you have to kind of make your report to get your your money back. And he explains how difficult and complicated it is to reconciliate all these things. And he ends up by telling what happened when he had to pay taxes for his crypto payments. And he simply put these addresses, so I assume it's you know, Bitcoin or Ethereum addresses, into a software, and the software gave, it, gave him exactly the result. And you can see this if you go in on platforms like crypto platforms like Zapper.fi or DBank and many others. You basically just give them a wallet address. You don't even have to connect your wallet. You give them a wallet address and they tell you exactly how much money you have, how much um, the, the trades you made, the, the, the staking, the farming and all these things we do in DeFi. Then you could put five of your addresses and they aggregate it for you so they have a total visibility on that data now apart the fact that we may not want to have all this transparency but we have it today in blockchains the fact that uh, calculations and consolidations and everything else can be done so easily i mean i don't mean these companies have an easy job to do it but it's it's a program right once it's done it's automatic compared to trying to, you know, get all your credit card payments, your bank, and, you know, everything goes in the hands of, of your tax guy, and the tax guy has to manually insert stuff. This is, you know, in 2022. Why? Because all this financial data is hidden, uh, while in, uh, in crypto, and we're talking about on-chain stuff, of course, nothing which happens on Binance or Coinbase is transparent unless they give you an API, now, uh, when you when you deal with on-chain transactions, it it really makes everything much much more efficient. The same thing will happen in travel. The same thing will happen in travel. You know, you're gonna put your address, and then you're gonna know exactly everything you've done, and you're gonna be able to even out make things automatic. And Cynthia Huang from uh, D Travel says something much farther in the panel about um, about identity, in which she says, and that's very interesting, you have your identity on a blockchain, right? You have an address. And that address can be read. And so the, the, the content can be read by other companies. And a hotel may know that you want a soft pillow or may know that you don't care about breakfast or whatever. I can't remember the examples. So you could build your own persona, even if it's, you know, it doesn't have to be real stuff. You could even create a specific persona for a specific kind of trip. Let's say solo tourist trips and then another persona for family travels or another persona for business travels. And you put all your um, preferences in there and then the hotel gets a booking from you and they adapt the room for you. You don't have to tell them. In every single hotel, write an email and say what you want. Uh, you can make this automatic. So open data in travel is going to change everything in ways we can't even imagine. Again, the scomorphic thing, right? Now we, we are thinking to say, okay, how, what is personalized today in travel? Well, this, this, and that. Okay, we can do this more like easily with blockchains, but we're not thinking about the the things we, we, we will do and we will be able to do when the data is open. Then going back to, to payments, uh, Nadim El Manawi from Arise Travel He's talking about payments and he mentions uh, stable coins and he says stable coins are going to be basically uh, very very widely used in in travel and yeah of course that's my comment here stable coins were invented by crypto exchanges to have a way to transact quickly and transparently uh, between each other so you had i don't know binance and then you had bitfinex that they had to send each other money and they were using bank accounts at the beginning. And bank accounts are horrible for two reasons. Uh, one is that they're very slow. Second, they're not finite. So um, they're not finalized. So you do you know if you're going to get that money. Maybe Binance sent it to Bitfinex and then something happened in the middle, especially with crypto companies. You know, 
banks never liked them, so they could block payments, whatever. Uh, maybe Binance had to receive money from Bitfinex, and then Bitfinex gets uh, you know some kind of problem with the bank. The money never arrives. So they said, let's create a stable coin, and the first one was USD Tether, so we can exchange stable coins, and they did it, and stable coins took off. Uh, why wouldn't we use stable coins for the travel industry? In, you know, simply for settlement between um, corporates, between companies. Um, well, we will use them um, as soon as companies. I think two two things have to happen. One, companies have to feel that the stable coin is actually stable, like they can trust it, and maybe USDC is the closest to make this happen more than USDT, uh, which is kind of in, from the point of view of the, you know, corporate world, like more shady. I have my own idea on USDT. And, and the other thing is that wallets, they have to be able to, to manage wallets. But again, do we need wallets when you can have a Coinbase account and have the money sent there? And we discussed this and we're going to have to discuss this more in the future. Do you, Companies need actually need wallets and treasuries when they can use exchanges for that. And I know it's weird to say after FTX blew up, but uh, let's say Coinbase, right? Let's say the Coinbase is actually very, very sure, very secure. I, I can't tell you that. I think so, at least from you know the people I follow in crypto, I trust the people who are saying FTX wasn't sure. Um, the moment people will trust Coinbase to keep their money, and Coinbase, by the way, is not only an exchange, they only do this treasury management, they will say, send me the money to my Coinbase account, which is basically send the money to my bank. And you're going to send crypto there. And this is, you know, basically instant and, and traceable. So we don't maybe need to actually have, wait for every company in travel to learn to use wallets or safes. You know, always refer to the Nozzy safe, which were branded to safe. Maybe we're going to get before to a more like traditional situation, which somebody is the custodian of your money as a bank. Only it's not custodying your fiat money, it's custodying your crypto. That could be companies like Coinbase and others. They then go ahead and talk about identity. And uh, the answer, the consensus seems to be that uh, corporate identity will happen first. Basically, companies... Um, creating an identity and kind of very fine that this company probably owns this address. I think they're talking about addresses here. I mean, blockchain addresses. And uh, and then personal identity will come a bit later. Now, in terms of identity, uh, we had an early project from Winding Tree, which was uh, org.id, which basically was a way to connect your wallet address to your company and I, I did it uh, for chips community and you had to stake uh, some of their tokens and I did that too. I don't know where they stand now. They all also integrated with Claros in case of disputes like because I could say I am Marriott and then Marriott wants to dispute that and they do it through Claros. Um, but in general corporate identity I, I have to admit I never thought about this a lot because I'm not thinking too much about corporate in general. Uh, maybe I should but yeah I don't see well, I don't see a problem there. A company says, I am this company, that's my address. And it's easy to kind of make this affirmation. Uh, but how do you know, how is this done in a decentralized way? Because if it's centralized, then you trust in somebody to say, yes, that company said this is their address. Okay. And in this panel, they're not talking about ENS. Um, maybe a way to for a company to... Uh, say who they are is to acquire the ENS domain. Um, let's say you are Marriott instead of Marriott.com. You well, you have Marriott.com. You acquire Marriott.eth, and and then you connect it to Marriott.com because this is a probably a not well known factor, um, well known fact out of the crypto industry. The domain name space uh, of ENS domains has agreements with the protocol of well not a protocol but with the dot com right uh, basically you if you have the dot com you also have priority on the ATH so you could for instance 
point the fact that you can say marital.com wants you know to act uh, on the blockchain it can do with .com or you can send money to .com if they own the ETH and if somebody bought the Marriott.eth, they can and they are not Marriott, they can't do it. Uh, they, they they won't be recognized. So I, again, this gets very technical. But the ENS domain protocol could be actually the basis for uh, identity in for Web three for for travel companies in in, in Web three, and that will be. A highly decentralized way to do it now is this going to take over or are we going to use different systems i don't know uh, what i know is that the dot eth or dns domain in general uh, protocol is gaining a lot of adoption in in, in crypto land uh, in the new decentralized social networks etc etc so my bet is on ens Hopefully, because I, I got a nice airdrop from there from them a year ago or something. So if it becomes, the price will go up. I think I have to say this in terms of uh, like disclosure. So I'm also a delegate for ENS, um, for the votes. Uh, but yeah, I don't see anything as decentralized and uh, long-term protocol as, as ENS domains for, for identity. And this is both for companies and, and individuals. And, and Nadine El Manawi says uh, the identity problem won't be led by travel. Uh, he says the single person, the individual, because travel will lag behind. Uh, but for corporate, yes, because it's already happening in, in his view. And I, I don't know actually what he refers to, or probably they're using some kind of system for uh, defining the identity of a company. Well, and that's basically it. Um, I suggest you to, to check them out. It's, again, it's a very nice panel with high-level discussions, finally. And um, I hope I kind of gave you a bit of more of context and I hope my, my perspective adds a little bit of value to this. And well, let's see if I do it again. Um, I, I found it very interesting for myself because I found at least two companies I want to um, analyze well the travel and knew it already and um, and I learned some stuff which is I have to be honest it's pretty rare not because I know everything it's because I'm basically closed in a bubble in which I I don't find a lot of material to learn from um, maybe because I'm not spending time in doing that so while doing this on the podcast kind of forces me to listen to other people and Come down from this pedestal in which I'm, you know, the Web3 travel guy who knows everything. I don't know anything. Like the first guy, um, Brooke Armstrong, was talking about stuff I didn't understand because I don't understand a lot of dynamics in travel, in travel, especially the corporate dynamics. So this is a learning process for me too. Um, and that's where I get the value from. I hope you get value from, from me sharing this with you. All right, this is the end of today's episode. I really hope you enjoyed it. For more insights on Web3, follow me on Twitter at Tripluca, T-R-I-P-L-U-C-A, and see you next time.